Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Precious Simona, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on harm reduction principles. Here are a few house or Zoom keeping considerations to have in mind during our session. The recording of this webinar will be available to you on targethiv.org. And please engage non-verbally in the webinar using the reactions as displayed. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. And at that time, we ask that you raise your hand using the Zoom feature and we will call on participants to ask their questions. We would like to acknowledge that, Elevate, that the Elevate program is supported 100% by HRSA. The contents of this presentation represents the views of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official, official views of, nor are they endorsed by HRSA, HHS, or the US government. Additionally, the people in this presentation are models and may or may not have HIV. We want to take the time to also acknowledge and thank our partners for the Elevate program. NMAC is leading the Elevate in partnership with the JSI Research and Training Institute Incorporated, the Association of Nurses in AIDS Care, the Latino Commission on AIDS, and ICF. We're going to start off with a few introductions. I'll start. Again, my name is Precious Alona, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a webinar developer for Elevate with JSI. My name is Michelle Dawson. My pronouns are also she, her, and I am JSI's webinar lead. And we're so pleased to be here today with our colleagues at NMAC. So in today's webinar, we're going to be going over some harm reduction principles. And by the end of today's webinar, you'll be able to describe the philosophical basis of harm reduction, the movement's historical roots, and how it currently influences other service areas. You'll be able to explore your own ideas and attitudes about harm reduction, be able to brainstorm strategies for a step-down harm reduction approach or an identified behavioral challenge, and identify next steps to integrate harm reduction approaches into your work. Before we get started with the webinar, we want to help you explore your attitudes towards harm reduction with the survey. There are a total of 10 questions, and we will give everyone 20 to 30 seconds to record their responses into the chat. So let's get started. Question number one. Harm reduction encourages people to use substances or engage in risky behavior. True or false? All right, now let's move on to question number two. Adopt, adopting a harm reduction approach means condoning substance use or risk behavior. True or false? All right, now we'll move on to question number three. People with substance use challenges will never have to own up to their substance use and quit with a harm reduction approach. True or false? Now let's move on to question number four. A harm reduction approach places people at greater risk of harm, of harm and danger because of their lifestyle. True or false? All right, now let's move on to number five. People with substance use challenges cause their own problems, and that's why they need to stop using substances. True or false? All right, now let's move on to number six. A harm reduction approach encourages more crime and danger to the public because it doesn't mandate substance use treatment. True or false? All right, now let's move on to number seven. Harm reduction is a move towards legalization of illicit drugs. True or false? 
All right, and now let's move on to question number eight. People with substance use challenges can get over their problems if they want to. True or false? All right, and now let's move on to number nine. Abstinence from use is the best intervention for all substance users. True or false? All right, and lastly, let's do number 10. Harm reduction should be condemned, true or false? All right, thank you so much for your participation in the chat. Remember that we will do a self-assessment again at the end. Now let's move into the webinar. So we're here today to talk about harm reduction, which is good because it's really misunderstood. Just within the last month or so, harm reduction has actually been in the news a lot, partly because people don't, so many people don't understand what harm reduction is and how it helps support people to be healthy. A quick search of Google and Twitter pulls up thousands of tweets and news stories about harm reduction. I've included just a few clips here on the screen. And we see that the White House has taken action on harm reduction. We see that elected officials and the general public often misunderstand how harm reduction works and that stigma still persists around harm reduction strategies. We see that harm reduction interventions such as syringe services programs can help to contain outbreaks of HIV and that groups work hard to educate around the purpose and value of harm reduction approaches to service delivery. Recently, the Biden-Harris administration released the new overdose prevention strategy that promotes harm reduction by increasing availability and access to high quality harm reduction services, decreasing negative effects of substance use and reducing stigma related to substance use and overdose. Today's webinar will help you to understand what harm reduction is and how harm reduction services help people where they are without judgment, stigma or discrimination. Now, let's get into what harm reduction really is. Harm reduction is a set of policies, programs, and practices that aim to reduce harm associated with substance use in people who are unable or unwilling to stop. The defining features are the focus on the prevention of harm rather than the prevention of substance use itself, and the focus and respect for people who continue to use substances. That's the big takeaway here, that harm reduction is about just that, preventing as much harm as possible. Harm reduction really takes a people's first approach to care and is grounded in respect for people who use substances. It's about meeting a person where they are and helping them to be as healthy and as safe as they can be at that point. The term harm reduction can refer to a number of things. For starters, it can refer to a philosophical and political movement and subsequently the community that has grown from those movements. It can refer to a framework that can be used in other contexts like smoking cessation, heart health and therapy, or everyday instances like wearing a seatbelt, using sunscreen, and putting on a mask when you go to the grocery store. When you think of harm reduction, you should also think of the services that one could receive. Harm reduction services are a set of specific substance, substance use, infectious disease, and health intervention, interventions typically associated with the harm reduction movement. As we continue with the webinar, tell us in the chat, what are some harm reduction services that you may have heard of? Now, let's take a moment and hear from Dr. Tartarski, who will provide a nice summary of what we just learned about harm reduction. Harm reduction means reducing the harm of potentially harmful activities. And we engage in harm reduction all the time when we drive cars and put on seatbelts, when we ride bicycles and we wear helmets. It emerged specifically as an alternative to an abstinence-only approach, which closes down the possibility of helping people across the spectrum. It also enables us to start where people are as really a fundamental tenet. Positive change can refer to safer behavior, to reducing the behavior, to stopping altogether. 
We mentioned a few moments ago that there is a philosophical and political movement of harm reduction. These movements grow out of the eight principles of harm reduction. So let's spend a few minutes talking about those principles, those key aspects of harm reduction. According to the Harm Reduction Coalition, harm reduction incorporates a spectrum of strategies that include safer use, managed use, abstinence, meeting people who use substances where they're at, and addressing conditions of use along with the use itself. Because harm reduction demands that interventions and policies designed to serve people who use substances reflect specific individual and community needs, there is no universal definition of or formula for implementing harm reduction. However, the National Harm Reduction Coalition considers the following principles central to harm reduction practice. The first principle of harm reduction is a recognition that substance use is a part of our world. Rather than ignoring it or condemning substance use, whether that's licit or legal substance use or illicit illegal substance use, people who do harm reduction work try to reduce the negative effects of substance use as much as possible. Harm reduction is grounded in the understanding that substance use is complicated and that people's experiences with substance use vary widely. Substance use includes a whole continuum of behaviors from total abstinence to extreme misuse and acknowledges that some ways of consuming substances are clearly safer than others. Harm reduction centers the quality of individual and community life and well-being as the definition of a successful intervention or policy. This is very different from an approach that centers abstinence or cessation of substance use as the goal. So in the chat, tell us, what is the way in which harm reduction can make a person who uses substances quality of life better? Just give you a moment to respond. Thanks, if you think of others, you can feel free to chat them in. Harm reduction also requires the non-judgmental, non-coercive provision of services and resources to people who use substances and the communities in which they live in order to assist them in reducing attendant harm. So in the chat, tell us why you think non-judgmental, non-coercive services are important. I think it helps to ensure that people feel safe to come to you. If a person uses illicit or illegal substances, they may be concerned that receiving services will put them at risk for incarceration or other types of punishment, that they'll be reported in some way. That's not at all the goal of harm reduction efforts. The respect, understanding, and support that people receive from harm reduction services um, and harm reduction service providers is really going to be what encourages people to access the services that they need and to continue to return to them for as long as they're needed. Harm reduction efforts should also ensure that people who use substances and those with a history of substance use routinely have a real voice in the creation of programs and policies designed to serve them. Why is this important? Well, just like we see in HIV, programs designed by community members for community members are able to really pinpoint what it is that the community needs to be effective. Harm reduction programs can be entry points into the service and care system, and whether that's substance use treatment or HIV prevention and care, or, or even primary medical care for other conditions. So it's important that these services be culturally appropriate and responsive as they can be. And there's no better way to do that than through the inclusion of people with lived experience in their development. Harm reduction should also include substance users themselves as the primary agents of reducing the harms of their substance use. Each person is an expert in their own needs and they are the person best positioned to say what it is that they need in that moment. Harm reduction efforts also seek to empower users to share information and support each other in strategies that meet their actual conditions of use. The last two principles of harm reduction are by no means the least important. Effective harm reduction programs recognize the realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, past trauma, discrimination, and other social inequities that affect both people's vulnerability to and capacity for effectively dealing with substance-related harm. This again goes back to our discussion from a moment ago where we talked about how important it is for harm reduction programs to be culturally responsive and non-judgmental. Lastly, harm reduction doesn't attempt to minimize or ignore the real and tragic harm or danger associated with licit and illicit substance use. This is one of the big misconceptions of harm reduction programs that they enable or encourage substance use and facilitate some of the negative repercussions associated with substance use. That's not the case. 
The programs actually help to get people on their way to healthier behaviors and even help some uh, on the path to um, recovery or to reduce, reduce or cease their substance use. It's just that harm reduction programs recognize that recovery might not be an option right now and seeks to prevent and reduce harmful effects in the meantime. And the graphic on this page shows that harm reduction goes hand in hand with recovery. By always working to meet people where they're at, uh, you're helping them towards tomorrow and maybe a step further along in their recovery. So let's see what we've learned so far. Which of the following is not an example of a harm reduction activity? Wearing a condom when you have sex, wearing a helmet when you ride a bicycle, wearing a seatbelt when you ride in a car, providing clean syringes or needles to a person who injects drugs, wearing masks in public places during outbreaks of respiratory illness, or putting warning labels on cigarette packages. That's right, putting warning labels on cigarette packages that smoking causes cancer might be a good idea, but it's not really a harm reduction strategy because just kind of advising people of the danger of smoking. An example of a harm reduction related to smoking cigarettes might be helping someone to reduce the number of cigarettes that they smoke in a day. So let's now hear from Terrell, who's going to tell us a little bit about his experience with harm reduction. Well, harm reduction saved my life because it's about making incremental changes. Coming to harm reduction where the arms were open, I was comfortable talking to people about things I never spoke about in my life. I was starting to feel like a human being instead of labeled a drug dealer, a menace, a crackhead, you know? They didn't use those words to me. They spoke to me and they used my name, Terrell. So now that we know what harm reduction is, let's take a moment to learn more about the history of the harm reduction movement. According to the Harm Reduction Coalition, harm reduction finds its roots and inspiration across multiple movements and strategies emerging across the United States in the 1960s, the 1970s, and the 1980s. In the 1960s, the Black Panther Party established to rival programs such as free breakfast for children and health clinics. The Free Breakfast for School Children was a community service program that focused on providing nutritious meals to children that were affected significantly by poverty. They also established the People's Free Medical Clinic to ensure that community members could receive adequate health care without the discrimination that they might have received when going to a hospital or private practice. In the 1970s, we really started to see the beginnings of harm reduction. This timing sort of coincided with the start of the HIV epidemic, as it became clear that people who inject drugs were highly impacted by HIV. Harm reduction was really popular at the time as people looked for ways to protect themselves and the members of their community. For example, the Young Lords launched an acupuncture program for heroin users in the South Bronx that looked to alleviate the symptoms of withdrawal, with the belief being that if folks experienced fewer withdrawal symptoms, they may be more able to easily stop using heroin. Indeed, the program was very successful, but it was also a source of concern for some people. Harm reduction efforts really took off in the 1980s as the need for HIV prevention increased. But because of the rise in the number of those who had AIDS, harm reduction became important for multiple reasons, including reducing transmission of blood-borne infection and treating substance use disorders. As a result, prevention programs became more available and utilized with syringe exchange programs being the most well known. However, as these programs started, they were met with resistance that continues today. The resistance being the belief that they condoned the use of drugs, despite the fact that it was clear from the start that people who use substances share many of the same experiences of stigma, discrimination, and disparities in care experienced by those with and at risk for HIV and that injection drug use was a mode of transmission for HIV. As a consequence of the movement's origins, harm reduction has become intrinsically linked to a variety of specific health and substance use intervention programs, namely syringe exchange programs, which is a social service 
that allows people who inject drugs the ability to obtain clean and unused needles and at a little or no cost. Overdose prevention education, which provides knowledge to individuals who are looking for more effective and factual information on ways to avoid opioid abuse and potential overdose. You have medication-assisted treatment, which is a multi-pronged approach to address the national crisis. It includes educating physicians, regulating prescription pain relievers, challenging pharmaceutical companies, and expanding access to Narcan, an opioid antagonist that can reverse overdoses. You also have wound care clinics, which are medical facilities for treating wounds that do not heal. Skin and wound issues are seen frequently in people who inject drugs and help tremendously helpful in harm reduction. You have peer navigation and organizing, which in relation to harm reduction, typically assists clients with substance use disorders by introducing, introducing their clients to available programs and services. And lastly, you'd have maintenance support groups, which can provide a robust network someone can turn to while on their road to recovery. There are many benefits to support groups, including gaining hope, helping others, and realizing that you are not alone. Harm reduction efforts continue today. This video spotlights harm reduction at the Idea Exchange in Miami, Florida, a comprehensive syringe services program where staff work to deliver integrated HIV and harm reduction services to people who use substances and those in recovery and learn from research projects how to optimize care to achieve the best outcomes. It provides a good overview of what harm reduction can look like today. Harm reduction was started by people who use drugs to save each other's lives. Here on 7th Avenue, right under the sun in Miami is Florida's pioneering syringe service program, the ID Exchange, where tools like harm reduction, advocacy, and compassion are being used to save lives. At the intersection, stories of research, compassion, and HIV services for people who use drugs. What is harm reduction? At the intersection where compassion meets community, harm reduction takes on a more active role to avoid negative health outcomes. And it does so by meeting the community where they are at. Harm reduction is basically bettering a person's life in the whole community. Harm reduction to me is being able to go to a place and get clean stuff to use and not have to like rely on like going to a street and buying it or like hoping you're getting something clean or whatever it is. Harm reduction is understanding the world of the other and immersing yourself in it for long enough to understand from their point of view, meeting them where they're at. Just like we meet people on the street with syringes, I meet my patients by, by kneeling down. You just have to do what you have to do in order to, to be on that level and be on the same wavelength of the people that you're taking care of. Harm reduction to me is making sure our our people here are taken care of. Harm reduction is basically just having a place to go to or people to talk to about anything and everything. Harm reduction is, is giving more because that's what they need in the moment. They offer like, you know, Suboxone to help you get off or whatever it is, like they work with you here. And I just think that's amazing because Really, we didn't have a place like that. Suboxone is a medication used to treat opioid use disorder. So the studies that show people who use SSPs are five times as likely to enter treatment. Syringe services programs like ID Exchange can provide a range of services, including sterile syringes, vaccinations, HIV testing, and help accessing substance use treatment. Nearly 30 years of research shows syringe services programs are safe, effective, and cost-saving tools that can prevent HIV and other complications among people who use drugs. Last night, that we started 12 people on Suboxone, and those are people who otherwise would not have had access to this life-saving medication, and now they're on their road to recovery. Harm reduction is the first step in recovery. Syringe services is the first step. But now we have the ability to start people on life-saving medications for opioid use disorder. We're helping people in their recovery, but wherever they are on that spectrum. We have to respect the autonomy of our patients and understand that our one way of doing things does not work. We have to adapt and have a personal approach for everybody that we serve. Harm reduction is holding someone by the hand 
and saying, you're gonna come with me because I have the time to commit to you because you're worth it. And so what do you need? Do you need to go to detox? I'm gonna go with you. Did you get them to the door? Did you follow up two days later to make sure they're still in treatment or did they fall out? It should be, hey, I'm in this journey with you. You've now met me. You seem to want to do something to better your life and I'm gonna support you. Let's run that mission. Harm reduction is understanding and compassion and strength and very nuanced. Harm reduction, it's love. So now that we know the principles of harm reduction, let's take a look at how groups take a harm reduction approach to care. We call it the harm reduction pyramid approach. The harm reduction pyramid approach is a tool that individuals can use to see just how risky their behavior is. Um, and let's take a look at it. The harm reduction pyramid approach believes that some risks are worse than others, and individuals can weigh the risks that they take to find a way to reduce risks that work for them. Harm reduction is a step-down approach that respects that clients are the experts in their own lives. In this approach, Individuals are encouraged to address what's most risky. Think about examples from your own life where you've made a decision to lower your risk. Your own work with clients may involve helping them to consider the risk that they're taking in their lives and thinking of ways to reduce it. If we take this example of traffic deaths, we see that at the top of the pyramid, the riskiest part is that a person is speeding, tailgating, texting, drinking, and not wearing a seatbelt. When we look at this, there's risks to the person themselves, but there's also risks to the people around them, passengers in the car, other drivers, pedestrians, all of whom might be impacted by this person's driving habits. So what we would ask this person is, what changes can we make to reduce the risks to themselves and to others? Certainly, we would wanna see a person driving within the speed limit with an appropriate following distance while sober, not distracted, and wearing the seatbelt. But that might not be a reasonable request for this person at the top of the pyramid. A harm reduction approach might be to help them to make a choice about what they could most easily drop. Um, if the person elects to stop speeding, they're, you know, they've moved down a little. Um, maybe after some time, they'll decide to stop texting and driving. And the hope is that by making small changes, um, they'll move to a lower risk level. But in the meantime, the risk of death or serious injury both to themselves and to others around them goes down. Now let's review a harm reduction case study together. Ed is a 52-year-old gay male who has been living with AIDS for over 20 years. He has a history of poly substance abuse ranging from alcohol use to years of previous cocaine use. Ed has agreed to participate in therapy sessions to address his depression, anxiety, and later his substance abuse. In year one, Ed agreed to weekly individual therapy, and he was open about his lifestyle and substance abuse history with his therapist. The focus was mainly put on building a sense of self-efficacy and monitoring alcohol intake. Later in his first year, he was able to reach a, tr a treatment goal and attributed it positive physical and emotional changes to changes in his behavior. During his second year of therapy, Ed relapsed but was able to bounce back. He began working on triggers, cravings, and resentment. Meditation was used for stress management, and Ed began using a vaporizer for nicotine and THC, which led, which led him to consume cigarettes less. His individual therapy sessions turned into him being willing to participate in group sessions and even panel discussions. At the end of year two, Ed reached another milestone. Ed focused on processing his progress and adjusting to life without alcohol during his third year of therapy. He had control over his life, that he had never experienced before. Ed's story proves that utilizing therapy and support groups as forms of harm reduction can be helpful in changing the trajectory of someone's life. Now let's see what harm reduction looks like in practice. We're gonna take a moment to watch a video. We'll watch for a bit, pause for discussion, and then we'll watch the next bit. This video includes people who identify as having been intravenous drug users who are able to switch roles of provider and patient to demonstrate the importance of partnerships, patient and provider interaction, and agency policy. Note that sometimes 
people use terms to describe themselves and their community that aren't person-centered. Um, also, this video takes place in Canada, Toronto, but uh, things hold. Okay, so um, before we finish up, we wanna highlight our key takeaways just one more time. First, harm reduction is a set of policies, programs, and practices that aim to reduce the harm associated with substance use in people who are unable or unwilling to stop. The defining features are the focus on the prevention of harm rather than the prevention of the substance use itself, and the focus on and respect for people who continue to use substances. Harm reduction is a step-down approach that respects clients as the experts in their own lives. And harm reduction strategies are used to address a wide variety of issues, for example, HIV prevention, tobacco use, and diabetes. So in the chat, tell us, um, thinking about your own work, how can you apply a harm reduction framework to your work in HIV? It could be in prevention or treatment or care. Okay, and before we transition over to our question and answer portion, let's go back to those questions that we asked at the beginning of the webinar to see if our attitudes or thoughts about harm reduction have changed. So in the chat, go ahead and tell us what you think. Um, so for to begin, let's think about whether harm reduction encourages people to use substances or to engage in risky behavior. Okay. On to the next question. Adopting a harm reduction approach means condoning substance use or risk behaviors. Okay. Third question. People with substance use challenges will never have to own up to their substance use and quit with a harm reduction approach. Okay. A harm reduction approach places people at greater risk of harm and danger because of their lifestyle. Okay. People with substance use challenges cause their own problems and that's why they need to stop using substances. Okay. A harm reduction approach encourages more crime and danger to the public because it doesn't mandate substance use treatment. Okay. Harm reduction is a move towards legalization of illicit drugs. Okay. People with substance use challenges can get over their problems if they want to. Abstinence from use is the best intervention for all substance users. And lastly, harm reduction should be condemned. Thanks for that reflection. All right. If you're looking for additional information and resources on harm reduction, be sure to check out the Harm Reduction Coalition website. The Harm Reduction Coalition is fully equipped with the Resource Center, Online Training Institute, and in-depth information on harm reduction issues ranging from overdose prevention to, medica to medication for opioid use disorders. You can also review Boston, Boston University's Community Health Worker Project Module 15. And that concludes today's webinar. We would like to thank you so very much for joining us today. We do have some time for questions and answers, so go ahead and think about and chat those in now while we make some announcements. Our next webinar will be on March 29th and will focus on structural determinants of health, the relationship to social determinants of health, and their impact on HIV prevention, care, and treatment. It will be another informative and interactive webinar, and we hope to see you there.
If you have any questions about the Elevate program, you should contact Charles Shazer or Lauren Miller at NMAC. And now we'll take questions through the chat. 